Hi there, I'm Andrea Koppel, and it's time for Coffee, the podcast where you get to hear firsthand what the jobs and careers that interest you the most are really like. Hey there, Java junkies, what's going on? Hope you're all staying healthy and not going too stir crazy. Welcome back to another episode of t for c If you're interested in breaking into marketing, especially digital marketing, then this is the episode for you because my next guest has spent the last eight years rocketing her way to the top of this industry and she's still in her 20s. But before I introduce you to Emily Hughes, marketing lead at Mobilize, I want to make sure you've signed up for the Java Junkies Journal. That's time for Coffee's weekly newsletter that comes out on Mondays and gives you a sneak peek into the episodes and the professions we're going to be featuring that week, and it couldn't be easier to sign up. Just head over to the Time for Coffee website at time, the number four, coffee.org, and the sign-up box is right there. Now, my matcha-drinking marketing lovers, please grab your mug and take a chug of your favorite caffeinated brew, because it's time for another caffeinated career conversation. And my guest is Emily Hughes, the marketing lead at Mobilize, the events management and volunteer recruitment platform that connects mission-driven organizations and their supporters. Emily is a self-described growth marketer, and business strategist who started out her career in 2012 as an account coordinator at Hager Sharp. It is now a 100% employee-owned, full-service, integrated communications and marketing firm that focuses on public interest, public sector issues, and organizations. Emily then moved to American Express Publishing, as manager of digital communications and social marketing. And within a year, she became the associate marketing manager of audience development at American Express Publishing, which was subsequently purchased by Time Inc. From there, Emily transitioned to Goop as their 23rd hire and first ever digital marketing employee as director of audience development. By the next year, Emily had co-founded her own digital marketing consultancy in the media and e-commerce space. And there is a lot more that we're going to be getting into in our main Time for Coffee interview. So please check out show notes for this episode to see if Emily's main t for c episode has already dropped. Emily, welcome to Time for Coffee. Are you caffeinated and ready to go? I am ready. Thank you for that trip down memory lane. (laughs) (laughs) You are so welcome. And, you know, I actually didn't even need to ask you if you were caffeinated because someone who has accomplished as much as you have since you graduated from college must be permanently hooked up to caffeine by an IV drip. (laughs) Yeah, that's about right. That sounds accurate. (laughs) (laughs) Do you enjoy coffee, tea, matcha? What's your brew of choice? I am a tea drinker. I was raised from people who drink tea multiple times a day. So, But that can span easily to matcha and chai. So I definitely get my caffeine intake. Nice, nice. Well, I am (laughs) so excited to tap into that brain of yours, that digital marketing brain to share with our young listeners who I know so many of them are super interested in this space, how they can break into it. So let's dive into our 10 espresso shots. The first question is, what entry level jobs, Emily, are available to young people who want to get into digital marketing? I think this is one of the great things about marketing is that there are tons of entry level jobs. It's one of the fields that has a clear trajectory from marketing assistant to chief marketing officer. So we're always hiring for, you know, marketing assistants, marketing coordinators, kind of entry level jobs in this field. And we're always, always looking for interns too. There's never a shortage of marketing tasks to go around. So looking for entry-level support is common. You also can get into marketing through kind of peripheral fields. So for example, I started in PR and I've hired people who started in sales or I've hired people 
who maybe started in a social media coordinator position. And they're all kind of overlapped enough that you can make the jump into a marketing role after that. You anticipated what my follow-up question was going to be, because (laughs) I do think having worked myself in PR, that it's fungible. In other words, a lot of the skills that you're honing in public relations, in communications, transfer into the marketing field. And your goals are often the same, right? It's growing this audience and converting it into whatever your business goals are. So yes, it's very easy to make that leap. An even better point than I just made. Thank you. Okay, (laughs) so what is a useful hard and soft skill, Emily, that you look for in the young people that you hire? Yeah, that is a great question. I hire and interview a lot. So I've given this a lot of thought. (laughs) The biggest hard skills I look for are the ability to work both sides of the brain. So if you are comfortable with data and numbers and reporting, but also with strategy and the creative aspects of the job, that is a huge selling point. For me, marketing definitely requires that you can kind of jump between the two and take something that's data-driven and translate it into something creative. And that is a rarity for people to have kind of built up both of those strengths. In terms of a soft skill, I really look for someone who's scrappy, like someone who can take initiative, can learn on the go, is a self-starter, can multitask, just someone who's really like organized and quick thinking and scrappy. That's really the best word for it. So... I just want to go back to the hard skill side of your answer. And when you say somebody who would be good with data, are you saying, in other words, somebody who's good with math, who's very comfortable using Excel, who is maybe they've taken data science courses or data analytics or things like that? Definitely. Like I use Google Analytics every single day. So if someone is comfortable with that platform, that's already an indicator that they could be successful here. You definitely don't need to be a master of calculus or algebra to get into marketing. But if you're comfortable taking numbers, understanding how to measure something and what that means in terms of action items to achieve your goals, then you would do well. Excellent. Okay, Emily, what about someone's major? Is it a deciding factor to get into your profession? In other words, if they haven't studied marketing or public relations or communications? Is it a deal breaker? No, I don't think so. I think marketing is something you can kind of learn on the go. And it really just requires that analytical thinking and that creative thinking often simultaneously. So if you have a business education, a liberal arts education, if you've kind of developed those critical thinking strengths, then you would do well in marketing. You know, it's obviously... A plus if you come from a marketing or communications background, but I've definitely hired people outside of those fields. I think that's really interesting that you say that it is a plus. And the reason that I am going to just gently push back is that I've heard from other guests in the field that marketing is evolving so quickly that sometimes some colleges are behind the eight ball when it comes to teaching what is actually current in the field today. I would say that's accurate. I I just hired someone who got a graduate certificate in integrated digital marketing. And I think that was a really great choice for her. She didn't study that undergrad. But to take a certificate course, they're more likely to be really up to speed with what's going on in the field. So yeah, I think that's that's a valid point. Not to put you on the spot here, but do you remember where she got her certificate? I'm sure it was online somewhere. You know, I think she wrapped it up before the world exploded (laughs) with COVID. (laughs) Okay. It may, I think it was from Florida State University. Okay. Okay. At any rate, if you have any suggestions for platforms that you respect that have different certifications, I would love to get those suggestions either right now or perhaps I could share them in show notes. Totally. There's two that right off the top of my head. Well, three, another one just came to mind. Okay. The first one is I mentioned Google Analytics. They have kind of introductory video courses that are free. So you can go on and teach yourself and create a free account and play around with it and follow their tutorials and learn it. 
Another one is HubSpot. They're a CRM platform, but they started in the marketing area. So they have great certification courses, some paid, some free in everything from like social media management to copywriting to digital marketing. And I have definitely pointed people to those before. And then the third one is actually something I have taken advantage of many times is General Assembly. Mm. They have in-person classes and online classes in everything imaginable. So I have taken them in things like Excel. Like if I felt like my Excel skills were kind of lacking or that I knew there was more I could get out of that platform, but I wasn't sure how. I signed up for a class, I think it was like $35 and it was a few hours and I learned so much from it. So those are definitely great resources to explore. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. What about a graduate school degree? And this is less so for those listeners who are really at the very beginning of their careers, more so, Emily, for somebody who wants to become a CMO, who wants to get into the C-suite, do you think it's necessary in order to succeed in your field? And if so, what do you think are the most useful ones to have? You know, this is something I think about a lot. I personally have considered getting my MBA just as I kind of move up the ranks and am involved in larger business strategy decisions. I have never taken a business course and felt like that may be beneficial to my career. But beyond that, I don't I don't think it's critical. Marketing, so much of marketing is hands-on work and you figure that out on the go or you learn from your managers or your teammates. And there's a lot you can learn within your career on the job. As I mentioned before, there are definitely certificate programs and graduate courses you can take that are very specialized and can help you build up certain skills. But I don't think it's critical by any means. The only reason that I'm about to say what I'm going to say is because after interviewing hundreds of professionals, Emily, I have seen firsthand in the data set that I've acquired that so many of us zig and zag. We zig and zag in and out of different companies and in and out of different careers. And for that reason, I think if I were someone your age in my 20s or early 30s, maybe even a little bit later, I would think about an MBA. I'm just saying very personally, because I think the skills that you acquire and the relationships that you build are so valuable as you advance. And it really opens up a whole nother world for you. Well, you may have just convinced me. (laughs) (laughs) The only kind of caveat to that is to go to a super, super good school. I don't think it's worthwhile to acquire all the debt going to a school that isn't one of the top 10. That would really be the kind of PS to that comment. All right. Agreed. What about life experiences, Emily? What, in your opinion, do you think are the most useful ones to have for somebody who wants to get into digital marketing? You know, I think if you feel like you have the ability to see things from other people's points of view, so you've gone through some experiences where you've had to build up some empathy, that's really helpful in marketing since so much of the job is persuading people to take an action. I was just speaking a couple weeks ago to actually my middle school. They had a career day. So I was speaking to sixth through eighth graders there. And was saying, you know, if you've ever been part of a club and had to promote its events, or if you've had a blog or a social media account, and you've had to grow traffic or followers, you've done marketing, like you figured it out yourself. And I think that's more and more commonplace as so much of our lives take place online, and we're building up these personal brands, you've already dipped your toe into the world of marketing. And if that's something you felt like was a strength or that you personally enjoyed, then you're well on your way already to potentially making that leap. I'm also curious about social media experience because clearly with the generation that you're a part of and Gen Z, they're digital natives. You're all digital natives. You've grown up with smartphones. How valuable is someone's ability to tweet, to post on Instagram, to do all of that? Is it or is it 
does it really depend how strategically their use of social media has been? Yes, you hit the nail on the head with that last question. So I think a lot of people come out of college or even later and say, you know, I, I have a great Instagram account, like I could do this. But it's very different kind of having fun with it and building a personal brand versus driving traffic to a site or fulfilling an ad campaign or selling e commerce or hitting whatever business goals there are using social media is a very different mindset. That said, if you do have great copywriting ability, a great eye for imagery, that will come in handy. But it is definitely a different mindset in the way you approach social media. Got it. Emily, what is the best part for you of being in digital marketing? You know, I we mentioned this, but marketing moves really quickly and it changes all the time. And I think for some people that would be very intimidating, but I love it. It keeps me on my toes. Every day is really different. I'm constantly learning new strategies, new tactics, new tools. And that's exciting to me. So that is probably my favorite part about this field. So if you don't like drinking from a fire hose on a regular basis, (laughs) don't go into this field. Run away. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. I have no doubt that there's a flip side because practically every job has aspects that aren't so much fun. So what is the part of your current job as the marketing lead at Mobilize that sucks the most? You know, I think this isn't specific to Mobilize in any means, but marketing overall can definitely involve some big personalities. And I'm sure sales and PR can relate to that. So you just kind of have to be willing to navigate that and be able to speak your mind and hold firm on your stance. I think also in certain situations, especially, you know, lately with everything going on in the world, people often think that they know best and that they can do marketing, even when it's not their background. But there's really a learned expertise here. So sometimes you have to take a lot of feedback, a lot of input and filter through that and say, actually, this is the best path forward, regardless of what others think. And that can be challenging. So it goes back to people who have social media accounts and are kind of armchair digital marketing you. Yes. Yes, exactly. (laughs) All right. Fair enough. Three final espresso shots. What is the best career advice you've ever gotten, Emily? I would say I have two. One is that if you're unhappy at your job or even if it's making you miserable, it's just not worth it. That is not the right place for you. And you should trust your gut and find something different. I think a lot of people get swallowed up by their job and think it's like the be all end all. But in reality, it should be fulfilling and it should make you happy. And that should be your top priority and your guiding principle. The second, which is more tactical, is to have a story for every item on your resume And I thought that was a great way to prepare for interviews and to kind of craft your resume in what are the stories that you are excited to tell about what you've accomplished and having those little like bite-sized pieces ready to go when you are interviewing with someone. I love that advice, especially the second one. And I actually have the benefit of seeing your resume. And it's something that I want to talk about in our main time for the interview (laughs) because I'm super impressed. I've never seen a resume like this. And underneath Emily's title on the left side of the page, under each title that she's held over the course of her career, she does have a short narrative. And I think that's so effective. And then on the right hand side, She has bullet points, which really do aggregate the impact that she had in her job. It isn't just words. There are a lot of numbers. And I think especially in the field that she's in and the job that she's in as a growth marketer and business strategist, wow, it's like kryptonite. It really makes the reader want to hire this woman. I mean, believe me, if I were in a position to hire (laughs) a a kick-ass marketer, Emily, you would be at the top of my list. I wouldn't be able to afford you, but you would be at the top of my list. And I think that is amazing, amazing advice to think about that narrative for every place you've worked and quantify, if you can, the impact that you had. 
Definitely. Having that balance is really powerful. Now, the only thing that I would say with respect to your first point, which in principle, I agree with, because our young listeners are more often than not at the very beginning of their career, and I am basing this on research that was done by Dr. Arthur Brooks, who's one of the first people I interviewed on Time for Coffee. He was then the president of a very big think tank in Washington, D.C., the American Enterprise Institute, and he's an economist. And the research that he did into happiness in careers shows that it takes 18 months before you can say with certainty that a job is a good fit or not. That's super interesting. I hadn't heard that before, but yeah. So for those who are starting out their careers, and especially in entry-level jobs where you're not always going to be working for a great manager, or you're not always going to be getting the sexy assignments. You're going to be doing things that you may find dull or not as exciting as you would like. I think the inclination then, Emily, would be to quit and move on. And perhaps in this job environment, and we're doing this interview in the middle of July, the middle of the coronavirus, you may not want to take a leap into another job until you've given it a year or 18 months. What do you think about that? I think that's really, I mean, if it's based on research, I can't really argue with it. I think that's really actionable advice and I may steal it moving forward. But I think that's fair. I think also every job requires compromises, right? So you also have to balance like, am I being too particular? Is this something I can deal with because I love the other aspects? Or is there really nothing of value here for me? So I yeah, I love that 18 month time period. I'm going to borrow that. You're welcome to I borrowed it. (laughs) (laughs) Two final espresso shots. What movies, if any, or Netflix, Amazon, Hulu shows, or books, do you think accurately depict your profession? I don't know if I have a great answer to this. I haven't found any that really accurately depict it. I will say, and I'm sure you've experienced this, Andrea, but a lot of people often think PR, marketing, and advertising are one and the same. So I used to get asked a lot if my life was like Mad Men at all, (laughs) and it's not at all. (laughs) So I mean, a little Don Draper in my life, but it's it's not like that. I have definitely heard, I don't watch Silicon Valley, I probably should, but I've had people ask me about that since I work with startups. So those are probably the two that come up the most, but my guess is neither of them really accurately depict what it's like to work in the field. I've watched some of Silicon Valley and I can say no. (laughs) (laughs) No, it's really more about trying to get a startup off the ground and getting venture capital and dealing with all the personalities that you find in that line of work. All right, final espresso shot. What would Java junkies be surprised to learn about your profession, Emily? You know, I harped on this a little bit, but I think how much math and data it does involve. So much of marketing now is measuring goals, building projections, figuring out what's working and what's not based on the numbers, A-B testing. So I think a lot of people kind of glorify it and think it's coming up with really creative taglines and like beautiful ad campaigns or design, you know, wonderfully designed websites. And there is a lot of that in there, but it's all based on the numbers. So we kind of start and end in those analytics. And that is something you don't really learn until you're in the weeds of it. Excellent. And by the way, you can also level up taking one of those certifications that Emily mentioned. Emily, thank you so much for making time for coffee today with me and the T4C community. If you're interested in learning more about what Emily does as marketing lead at Mobilize and how she built her super impressive career. Check out show notes for this episode to see if Emily's main time for coffee interview has already dropped. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for listening to Time for Coffee, where the professionals in the jobs that most interest you always have time to grab coffee. 
24-7, no matter where you live. I have one quick favor to ask you. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe to Time for Coffee. Thanks so much.